Uh, we're continuing to read The One and Only Ivan with uh, permission given to us from Scholastics. All right. We are on page 30. It's called Stella's Trunk. Stella's trunk is a miracle. She can pick up a single peanut with elegant precision, tickle a passing mouse, tap the shoulder of a dozing keeper. Her trunk is remarkable, but still it can't unlatch the door of her tumble-down domain. Circling Stella's legs are long-ago scars from the chains she wore as a youth. Her bracelets, she calls them. When she worked at the famous circus, Stella had to balance on a pedestal for her most difficult trick. One day, she fell off and injured her foot. When she went lame and lagged behind the other elephants, the circus sold her to Mac. Stella's foot never healed completely. She limps when she walks, and sometimes her foot gets infected when she stands in one place for too long. Last winter, Stella's foot swelled to twice its normal size. She had a fever, and she lay on the damp, cold floor of her domain for five days. They were very long days. Even now, I'm not sure she's completely better. She never complains, though, so it's hard to know. At the Big Top Mall, no one bothers with iron shackles. A bristly rope tied to a bolt in the floor is all that's required. They think I'm too old to cause trouble, Stella says. Old age, she says, is a powerful disguise. A plan. It's been two days since anyone's come to visit. Mac is in a bad mood. He says we're losing money, hand over fist. He says he's going to sell the whole lot of us. When Thelma, a blue and yellow macaw, demands, kiss me, big boy, for the third time in ten minutes, Mac throws a soda can at her. Thelma's wings are clipped so she can't fly, but she can still hop. She leaps aside just in the nick of time. Pucker up, she says with a shrill whistle. Mac stomps to his office and slams the door shut. I wonder if my visitors have grown tired of me. Maybe if I learn a trick or two, it will help. Humans do seem to enjoy watching me eat. Luckily, I'm always hungry. I'm a gifted eater. A silverback must eat 45 pounds of food a day if he wants to stay a silverback. 45 pounds of fruit and leaves and seeds and stems and bark and vines and rotten wood. Also, I enjoy the occasional insect. I'm going to try to eat more. Maybe then we will get more visitors. Tomorrow, I will eat 50 pounds of food. Maybe even 55. That should make Mac happy. Bob. I explain my plan to Bob. Ivan, he says, trust me on this one. The problem is not your appetite. He hops onto my chest and licks my chin, checking for leftovers. Bob is a stray, which means he does not have a permanent address. He is so speedy, so willy, that mall workers long ago gave up trying to catch him. Bob can sneak into cracks and crevices like a tracked rat. He lives well off the ends of hot dogs he pulls from the trash. For dessert, he laps up spilled lemonade and splattered ice cream cones. I've tried to share my food with Bob, but he's a picky eater and says he prefers to hunt for himself. Bob is tiny, wiry, and fast, like a barking squirrel. He is nut-colored and big-eared. His tail moves like weeds in the wind, spiraling, dancing. Ooh, personification. Bob's tail makes me dizzy and confused. It has meanings within meanings, like human words. I am sad, it says. I am happy, it says. Beware, I may be tiny, but my teeth are sharp. Gorillas don't have any use for tails. Our feelings are uncomplicated, our rumps unadorned. Bob used to have three brothers and two sisters. Humans tossed them out of a truck onto a freeway when they were a few weeks old. Bob rolled into a ditch. The others did not. That's a really sad 
thing. His first night on the highway, Bob slept in the icy mud of the ditch. When he woke, he was so cold that his legs would not bend for an hour. The next night, Bob slept under some dirty hay near the Big Top Mall garbage bins. The following night, Bob found the spot in the corner of my domain where the glass is broken. I dreamed that I'd eaten a furry donut, and when I woke in the dark, I discovered a tiny puppy snoring on top of my belly. It had been so long since I'd felt the comfort of another's warmth that I wasn't sure what to do. Not that I had not that I hadn't had visitors. Mac had been in my domain, of course, and many other keepers. I'd seen my share of rats zip past, and the occasional wayward sparrow had fluttered in through the hole in my ceiling. But they never stayed long. I didn't move all night for fear of waking Bob. Wild. Once I asked Bob why he didn't want a home. Humans, I noticed, seemed to be irrationally fond of dogs and I could see why a puppy would be easier to cuddle with than, say, a gorilla. Everywhere is my home, Bob answered. I am a wild beast, my friend, untamed and undaunted. I told Bob he could work in the shows like Snickers, the poodle who rides Stella. Bob said Snickers sleeps on a pink pillow in Mac's office. He said she eats foul-smelling meat from a can. He made a face. His lips curled, revealing tiny needles of teeth. Poodles, he says, are parasites. Picasso. Matt gives a fresh crayon, a yellow one, and ten pieces of paper. T time to earn your keep, Picasso, he mutters. I wonder who this Picasso is. Does he have a tire swing like me? Does he ever eat his crayons? I know I have lost my magic, so I try my very best. I clutch the crayon and think. I scan my domain. What is yellow? A banana. I draw a banana. The paper tears, but only a little. I lean back, and Mac picks up the drawing. Another day, another scribble, he says. One down, nine to go. What else is yellow? I wonder, scanning my domain. I draw another banana, and then I draw eight more. Three visitors. Three visitors are here. A woman, a boy, a girl. I start across my domain for them. I dangle from my tire swing. I eat three banana peels in a row. The boy spits at my window. The girl throws a handful of pebbles. Sometimes I'm glad the glass is there. My visitors return. After the show, the spit pebble children come back. I display my impressive teeth. I splash in my filthy pool. I grunt and hoot. I eat and eat and eat some more. The children pound their pathetic chest. They toss more pebbles. Silly chimps, I mutter. I throw a me-ball at them. Sometimes I wish the glass were not there. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I called those children slimy chimps. My mother would be ashamed of me. Julia. Like the spit pebble children, Julia is a child, but that, after all, is not her fault. While her father, George, cleans them all each night, Julia sits by my domain she could sit anywhere she wants, by the carousel, in the empty food court, on the bleachers, coated in sawdust. But I'm not bragging when I say that she always chooses to sit with me. I think it's because we both love to draw. Sarah, Julia's mother, used to help clean them all. But when she got sick and grew pale and, and stooped, Sarah stopped coming. Every night, Julia offers to help George, and every night he says firmly, Homework, Julia. The floors will just get dirty again. Homework, I have discovered, involves a sharp pencil and thick books and long sighs. I enjoy chewing pencils. I am sure I would excel at homework. Sometimes Julia dozes off, 
and sometimes she reads her books, but mostly she draws pictures and talks about her day. I don't know why people talk to me, but they often do. Perhaps it's because they think I can't understand them, or, or perhaps it's because I can't talk back. Julia likes science and art. She doesn't like Leela Burpee, who teases her because her clothes are old, and she does like Deshaun Williams, who teases her too, but in a nice way, and she would like to be a famous artist when she grows up. Sometimes Julia draws me. I'm an elegant fellow in her pictures with my silver back gleaming like moon on moss. I never look angry the way I do on the fading billboard by the highway. I always look a bit sad though. Drawing Bob. I love Julia's pictures of Bob. She draws him flying across the page, a blur of feet and fur. She draws him motionless, peeking out from behind a trash can or the soft hill of my belly. Sometimes in her drawings, Julia gives Bob wings or a lion's mane. Once she gave him a tortoise shell, but the best thing she ever gave him wasn't a drawing. Julia gave Bob his name. For a long time, no one knew what to call Bob. Now and then a mall worker would try to approach him with a tidbit. Here, doggy, they'd call, holding out a french fry. Come on, pooch, they'd say. How about a little piece of sandwich? But he would always vanish into the shadows before anyone could get too close. One afternoon, Julia decided to draw the little dog curled up in the corner of my domain. First, she watched him for a long time, chewing on her thumbnail. I could tell she was looking at him the way an artist looks at the world when she's trying to understand it. Finally, she grabbed her pencil and set to work. When she was finished, she held up the page. There he was, the tiny big-eared dog. He was smart and cunning, but his gaze was wistful. Under the picture were three bold, confident marks circled in black. I was pretty certain it was a word, even though I couldn't read it. Julia's father peered over her shoulder. That's him exactly, he said, nodding. He pointed to the circled marks. I didn't realize his name was Bob, he said. Me either, said Julia. She smiled. I had to draw him first. Bob and Julia. Bob will not let humans touch him. He says their scent upsets his digestion. But every now and then... I see him sitting at Julia's feet. Her fingers move gently, just behind his right ear. Mac. Usually, Mac leaves after the last show, but tonight, he is in his office working late. When he's done, he stops by my domain and stares at me for a long time while he drinks from a brown bottle. George joins him, broom in hand, and Mac says the things he always says. How about that game last night? And, business has been slow, but it'll get better. You'll see. And, don't forget to empty the trash. Mac glances over the picture Julia is drawing. What are you making? He asks. It's for my mom, Julia says. It's a flying dog. She holds, it up. she holds up her drawing, eyeing it critically. She likes airplanes and dogs. Hmm, Mac murmurs, sounding unconvinced. He looks at George. How's the wife doing anyway? About the same, George says. She has good days and bad days. Yeah, don't we all, Max says. Max starts to leave, then pauses. He reaches into his pocket, pulls out a crumpled green bill, and presses it into George's hand. Here, Max says with a shrug. Buy the kids some more crayons. Mac is already out the door before George can yell, Thanks! 